Hello, David Diga Hernandez here, and welcome to Spirit Church. Today I'm talking about the four realms of prayer. I believe that as you listen to this lesson today, as you receive from the Word of God, as we talk about prayer, that you're going to receive a tremendous breakthrough in your prayer life. I believe it with all my heart. These four realms, once you understand them, I believe will bring about a greater understanding of prayer and the breakthrough that you've been hoping for. But before I get into that lesson, Stephen Moctezuma is going to lead us in a worship song. Creating me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Creating me a clean heart, oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Always oh, just sing that again. Creating me, creating me a clean heart, oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Oh, create me, creating me a clean heart, oh God. And renew a right spirit within me And cast me And cast me not away From thy presence, O oh Lord And take not the Holy Spirit from me Restore unto me The joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. We sing and cast me not away. And cast me not away from thy presence, O oh Lord. Take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Renew a right spirit within me And renew a right spirit within me And renew a right spirit within me Oh, just wherever you are, just begin to praise Him And renew a right spirit within me Now I want you to prepare your heart for this lesson because I believe that as you listen to this today that God the Holy Spirit is going to bring about a greater understanding of prayer for you and as you come into the greater revelation of what prayer truly is and how to truly enter into the deep places of prayer that you're going to experience a breakthrough. Some of you you're going to reclaim your prayer life. Some of you have not been praying. You said, Lord, I, I don't pray like I used to pray. I don't seek you like I used to seek you. I don't, I, I don't even know how to manage my schedule to seek you like I used to seek you. But God is going to help you today and you're going to receive that breakthrough. And some of you, though you've been praying consistently, you've been, you've been desiring and hungering, you say, Lord, I want to enter into the depths of prayer like I never have before. Well, whether you're someone who's fighting to reclaim your prayer life or someone who's desiring to go deeper, who's been faithful with this prayer life, I want to encourage you today to receive from the Word of God. Go with me. John chapter 14, verse 26. This is what the scripture says. Thank you, Stephen. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything that I have told you. I love the way the King James puts it. He talks about the Holy Spirit reminding us and revealing to us the truth. He reminds us of the truth and He reveals to us the truth. So the Holy Spirit has a twofold job. He reminds and He reveals. He reminds you of the truths that you know and He reveals the depths of God in prayer and the Word and worship. As we begin to seek the Lord, as we begin to find those places of prayer where we're connecting with God on a deeper level and truly fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit, that's where the Holy Spirit can teach us things. I believe that God entrusts secrets because the scripture says that the secret of the Lord is with those who fear Him. I believe that God entrusts secrets to the faithful. God gives revelation to the faithful. God gives understanding to the faithful. 
He is, as he said to Abraham, our exceeding and great reward. Often we pray to try to get something or pray to try to get somewhere or pray to try to get a breakthrough and so on, not realizing that prayer itself is not a process, it is a relationship. Prayer isn't traveling to somewhere, prayer is the destination. Prayer in it of itself is heaven on earth. Prayer in it of itself is all that you could ever desire. Prayer in it of itself is the connection of God that you want. It's enjoying that fellowship for which Jesus died to give you. So when we pray, we're not just speaking words amiss. We're not just saying random things. When we pray, we're not just babbling. We're not just going in and fulfilling some religious ritual. When we pray, we are entering into the realm of the Spirit, and we can only get there led by the Spirit. John chapter 14, verse 26 says, He reminds and He reveals, It is by the Holy Spirit that we truly pray. It is by the Holy Spirit that we truly understand. It is by the Holy Spirit that we receive revelation that ignites our heart aflame with passionate love for Jesus. It is by the Holy Spirit that we love. Romans 5, 5 says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It is by the Holy Spirit that we experience the miraculous. It is by the Holy Spirit that we proclaim the word. It is not by power. It is not by might, but it is by my Spirit, says the Lord. So understanding prayer and I'm going to get into the four realms of prayer in just a few minutes. We have to first understand that it is the Holy Spirit who truly inspires us to pray. It is only by the Holy Spirit. Let me put it this way. You cannot be spiritual without the Holy Spirit. We know that. But not only could you not be spiritual without the Holy Spirit, you couldn't even desire to be spiritual without the Holy Spirit. So He is the one who draws us to the prayer room. He is the one who draws us to the throne room of God. He is the one who beckons us, who rolls out the carpet, who presents the royal invitation. You know, as you carry on throughout your day, you'll notice this drawing. You'll notice this, this pooling on your heart, on your mind. Maybe you pick up the word and you read for a few minutes and then you put it down and then you walk away or you go into your prayer room, you get on your knees, you seek God, you pray for a few minutes, then you're tired of it, you get up, you move on and then you're drawn back to it. That drawing is by the Holy Spirit. Even as I'm talking right now, I, I know that there is a hunger that's coming over you. There's a desire that's coming over you. You say, Lord, I want nothing more than to know you more and experience the very depths of your presence, the richness of your glory, the splendor that is the person of Christ. I want to know you more. I want to love you more. I want to obey you more. I want to understand you from every possible perspective. I want to know every revelation there is about you in the scripture. God, teach me to walk closely with you, and he's going to help you do that. But the way we connect, the way that the Holy Spirit takes us in. So it's by the Holy Spirit that we enter into prayer. It's by the Holy Spirit that we're drawn to prayer. And it's by the Holy Spirit that we understand how to pray. But as the Holy Spirit draws us in, He teaches us to do two things. Or I should say, He teaches us to find two things. The Holy Spirit, as we pray, teaches us to find silence and stillness. Now, I know I talk about this a lot, but it's, it's foundational to almost every spiritual message that I can bring to you. If you know me, my topics are pretty much the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, prayer, spiritual warfare, and you know, things like that. Um, but when it comes to all of those topics, when you understand silence and stillness, when you understand things like um, the body, the soul, and the spirit, when you understand things like the inner fellowship of the Spirit of God, when you understand those basic fundamental truths that are foundational to you understanding of every revelation that He might give you, it brings some greater revelation. It brings more application in your everyday life. So I want you first to know that the key to prayer, the true keys to prayer, are silence and stillness. If you cannot find silence and stillness, you'll never find the gateway that leads to the presence of God. If you cannot find silence and stillness, you'll never find your way in. Sure, Jesus paid the way. That's true. Jesus paid the way, but the Holy Spirit shows the way, and He cannot show the way unless we're listening. Jesus paid the price to connect us with God. So God the Father speaks. But the Holy Spirit cannot speak to you if you're not listening. The Holy Spirit can't speak to you if there's too much clutter. So silence and stillness are key. Let me tell you what they are. 
Silence is easy because it's practical. It's simple. Silence is the putting away of outer distractions. I'm talking about Facebook. I'm talking about television. I'm talking about entertainment. I'm talking about all of the worldly things that bring about the inner clutter of life and they distract us. That can be done by doing as Jesus said when he said, when you pray, go to your private place, go into a closet, pray privately, and your Father who sees you praying privately will reward you openly. Private prayer is revealed in public power. So private prayer brings about silence. It brings about quietness. Now in this day and age, that may be very difficult to find because everything is so fast paced, so rushed, so chaotic, but I want to encourage you that whether it's for five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes, find that time to pray. And I have another lesson, by the way, on Spirit Church about how to spend more time in prayer, but I won't address that today, but it is important that we learn how to spend more time in prayer. But when we do finally find that silence and we put things away, we'll find that there's something else that needs to be done because you'll put away outer distraction. You'll shut off your phone, your computer, your Facebook, your social media, your entertainment. You'll disconnect with people for maybe for five minutes to an hour or two hours, three hours, whatever your prayer time may be. And then you go to pray. You're saying, Lord, okay, I'm ready to seek you. You've done all of the practical things around you. You're saying, Lord, I'm coming in to pray. I'm coming in to seek you. I want to know you more. Your hunger is being stirred. Your passion is being stirred. And you come in ready to receive from God. And then you'll notice something else. You'll notice that though it's quiet on the outside, it's very noisy on the inside. You'll go to pray and the first thing that will come across your mind are all the mistakes that you've made, all of your worries, all of your concerns, all of your troubles, all of your relationship issues. You worry about finance, you worry about relationships, you worry about people, you worry about your ministry, your business, whatever it may be. You feel guilt, you feel worry, you feel shame, you feel anger, you feel, you feel resentment, you feel unforgiveness, you feel chaotic, you feel cluttered. And all of these things disrupt the inner peace that the Holy Spirit wants to give to you. And we say things like, well, I was perfectly fine until I went to pray. But that's not true. That inner chaos is ongoing. And the only reason you found it was because you silenced yourself long enough to hear it. You see, when you go to pray, it's not always, though the enemy does attack, it's not always that the enemy is trying to distract you. It's that you're already distracted on the inside and you just didn't realize it until you put aside the noise. It's not until you slow down and reflect that you begin to see what it's like on the inside of your heart. It's not until you slow down and find a quiet place that you begin to hear all the inner chatter of the heart and the chaos and the clutter. So when we pray, the Holy Spirit helps us found, find silence through the practical and discipline, but stillness through the Word. Now, there are two ways that the Holy Spirit helps us find stillness, and they're actually the first two realms of prayer. So let's get into that. The first realm of prayer is number one, requesting. Now, this may get a bad rap because people say things like, well, I don't want to ask God for anything because He's already done enough for me. Oh, well, I'm not looking to receive from God. I'm just looking for God. And trying to sound spiritual, we actually avoid a very key realm of prayer that really helps us to enter into silence and stillness. So, number one, the first realm is requesting. And the scripture says this, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Here's what I love about that verse. A couple things is, number one, anything that causes me to worry is a topic I'm allowed to bring into prayer. So if it worries you, know that it's not going to bother God if you bring it up. If you're worried about the bills, if you're worried about your job, if you're worried about your kids, if you're worried about your clothes, if you're worried about your food, if you're worried about the insignificant or the significant, if you're worried about what others might deem important and what others might deem unimportant, if you're worried about something, if you're concerned about something, if you're desiring something, know that your Heavenly Father welcomes you to bring it to His attention. Anything that worries you is perfectly okay to take before your Father. Anything that causes you worry is also cause for prayer. So God is not going to reject you and say, oh, that's unspiritual. And it's funny because even sinners know how to pray in this way. When they get into a bind, they pray. When someone dies, they pray. When they have trouble, they pray. When they need God, they pray. And so because it's, it's a basic part of, of, of humanity, within all of us, 
there's this great desire to connect with God, whether we realize it or not. And so men, when they're praying in their trouble, they don't realize they're participating in this first realm because it's so basic, it's so intrinsic, it's so fundamental. And it is the fundamental nature of the prayer request that causes us to deem it as somewhat carnal or selfish or immature. But believer, understand, it's not immature or carnal or selfish to ask God for things. You may say, well, I feel bad asking for a job promotion when there are children starving in Africa. Well, why don't you pray for the job promotion, get a better pay, and then send over some money to help those children in Africa? You see, God blesses and saves and touches, but He blesses, saves, and touches through people. So God doesn't have to take from someone else to give to you. God doesn't have to remove the food off someone else's plate in the third world country to bless you with a good job. That's not the way it works. Your God is not broke. Don't feel guilty to ask him for things. So, num so verse number six tells us, tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. So that tells me also in that verse, not only do the things that worry me count as prayer requests, but it also tells me that I can ask God for things while still being thankful. It doesn't mean I am, I am unthankful just because I ask God for things. That's according to verse 6. Then verse 7, and I hope this is giving some of you break because some of you are just so afraid to ask because in your heart you feel like a hypocrite or whatever. The enemy is lying to you. That, that's not of God. He wants you to ask. Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it shall be open. God encourages you to ask. Verse 7 says this, and I love this because it's conditional. It's conditional, and it's the word then has to do with when. So when is it okay, or when does it happen? When does the peace of God flood your heart? Well, let's start at verse 6 again. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need, and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So when does the peace of God flood your soul? After you make your prayer requests. God wants you. See, God gave us the prayer request as a gift to rid us of our worries, to rid us of our, our fears. And that's the first realm of prayer. So you enter through requesting. Uh, you, you can come in, you can say, Lord, here I am, here's my needs. And He allows you to get that out of the way. So this is the problem, though, because prayer starts with the prayer request. Often it does. Some, you can skip that. This is not any you know, rigid order. But often if you have that inner chaos, it's okay to ask God for things so that your heart can be still. But it takes faith. You have to ask in faith. Otherwise, it won't work. So you give them your prayer request, and God takes up the task of accomplishing those prayer requests. So you can trust him to decide what to do from there. You can trust that if he says no, it's for a reason. That if he says yes, it's for a reason. If he says later, it's for a reason. So he takes up our prayer requests and the peace of God floods our hearts. The problem comes when we present our prayer request to God, fill the peace, and then leave the throne room. Believer, you need to stay because that's just the beginning. That peace you feel it's not just so you can go about your day feeling good. That peace that you feel is so that you can walk in stillness and go deeper into the depths of God. That, that, I, need, I need you to understand this. This is important. That peace that you feel after you make your prayer request isn't just so that you can go about your day and experience peace. That peace that you feel is so that you can be in the proper state to enter into deeper realms. That's powerful. That's a powerful truth that the scripture gives us. So asking is not bad. It doesn't make you an immature Christian. It doesn't make you a carnal Christian. Ask him for things. Anything that worries you, just lay it on him. And then after he takes up the task and you trust that it's in his hand, he's capable, he's able, and he's willing, you leave it to him, you move on. The next realm of prayer is reverencing. John chapter 4, verse 23 says this, But the time is coming, indeed it's now here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. Just like true prayer is only by the Holy Spirit, true worship can only come by the Holy Spirit. Because all worship is a response to a revelation. This is why in a worship service you'll see people, they'll be, you'll, your hands will be uplifted, your tears will be flowing, you'll be singing the song, you're getting into it. You know, the, the, you feel the presence of God, everyone around you. And then you'll look around in the room and you'll see someone in the back just sitting there like this. They're unmoved. They don't want to worship. They're just angry or 
bored or whatever, or they're on their phone texting during worship. I don't condemn those people. I don't look down on those people. But you, we can't get angry at them. The reason they can't worship is because God hasn't been revealed to them. Because all worship is a response to revelation. This is why the scripture says that only those who are, that, that God is going to have those who worship in spirit and in truth, because truth only comes by the spirit. Spiritual things are received by the Holy Spirit in no other way. So the second realm is reverencing. And people ask me, and I honestly, I think, though requesting is good, and that's, that's part of it, because I believe that as you mature in your walk with God and your spirituality, you do less requesting and more reverencing. In other words, less prayer requests, more worship. And so here, in this second realm of reverencing, this is where beautiful things really begin to happen. Because it moves from being focused on me and my needs to being focused on God. So people ask me, you know, what's the key to the anointing or the power of God? Well, the key to the anointing or the power of God is prayer. And the key to prayer is silence and stillness. And the key to silence and stillness is worship. And the key to worship is revelation. And the key to revelation is the Word, coupled with the Spirit. So if you're in the Word, the Spirit will reveal. If the Spirit reveals, you have a revelation. If you have a revelation, you can worship. If you can worship, you can be silent and still. If you can be silent and still, you can truly pray. So all of this connects, but it's found in work. I mean, that's how I begin my prayer. Every day when I pray, I'll be, I don't start with the prayer request. I give those throughout, throughout the day to God when they come up, and then I just forget about them or work hard to accomplish with His help. But for the most part, my prayer life begins with just worship. Just, I just lift my hand and say, Lord, you're beautiful. Songs like, oh, Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see. As Stephen's saying here, create in me a clean heart, O God. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from with me. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after thee. And I do some of the new ones too. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. I give myself away. There's all of the songs that we can sing and when they're Christ-centered, when they're focused on God, they still the heart. Now, here's what the Holy Spirit does. This is beautiful. The Holy Spirit has been, is, and will always be the one who reveals the Son. The Holy Spirit is the one who took the Son of God and made Him into a man. That, that's a whole different lesson for another time. That's power right there. But the Holy Spirit is the one who caused Christ to become real. So as you worship, as you focus on the revelation that you've received. So if you know Him as healer, Savior, you don't have to know a deep, deep, deep truth to capture revelation. But whatever you've come to know about God, focus on that and then begin to worship God in response to that. Oh, and it, something will just stir up within you. If He got you out of a bind, worship Him as your provider. Just the fact that He saved you, worship Him as your Savior. Think of how, how, he, how marvelously and magnificently and how completely He saved you. Think about that. And focus on that and begin to worship. And that revelation inspires that true worship. And when that worship begins to take place, here's what happens. This is beautiful. As it begins to happen, the Holy Spirit begins to reveal more to your heart. And you focus on that revelation and the Holy Spirit causes that revelation as He caused the, 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 the Word to become flesh, John 1.1 1, 1, and then John 1.14. The Word became flesh. The Holy Spirit did that. But the Holy Spirit fleshes out the Son of God before the eyes of your heart. So that as you're worshiping, Jesus is becoming more of a vivid reality in front of the eyes of your heart within you. Let me tell you something. In these moments, the presence of Jesus can become so vivid, intensely real, that it's terrifying. I've been in, in prayer times where I thought that if I would open my eyes, I would see Jesus standing right there in front of me. I thought that if I'd reach my hand out, I might touch the hem of his garment and fill it in my hand. That's how real he's become. When I'm ministering to God's people, when I'm ministering at a miracle service or at spirit church, I'm trying to become aware of Jesus. And the more aware I am of him, the more powerful the service will be. In fact, I pray, Lord, be more real to me now than the people I'm ministering to. When Jesus becomes more real than your sickness, you're healed. 
When Jesus becomes more real than your bondage, you're set free. When Jesus becomes more real than your depression, you'll find joy. When Jesus becomes more real than your fear, you'll find peace. When Jesus becomes more real than your problem, he becomes your solution. And the Holy Spirit does this through worship. As you worship him, he becomes a vivid, intense, tangible reality that you feel like you can touch. And then that revelation inspires more worship. That worship inspires more revelation. And it's this reciprocal effect that begins to intensify in a moment. And you'll never want to leave that prayer room because you're experiencing and touching God. That's the second realm of prayer. And I can go on more and more on that, but there's more in this lesson. So number one is requesting. Number two is reverencing. Number three is resisting. This is spiritual warfare. Now, you know, there are all sorts of things you can pray for in spiritual warfare. So the scripture says, resist the devil and he'll flee. It doesn't say engage him. It doesn't say go after him. I've seen people casting out demons and it's almost silly. I think some of the deliverance ministries get very silly. I mean, what is your name? How did you get in there? And, and you know, I, I, I'm, I, I don't want to sound critical, but that's just not how I do it. I, what's, I mean, as most Jesus ever asked a demon is, what's your name? Once the name was told, he said, okay, well, leave. You know, so I don't really need to know all this information, but really we do need to realize that we're in a very real warfare. There is such a thing as angels. There is such a thing as demons. There is such a thing as God. There is such a thing as heaven. There is such a thing as hell. All of that is real. It's not an analogy. It's not a metaphor. They exist. They're actual demonic beings that seek to devour the believer. But anything that the enemy can do can be undone through resistance prayer. You resist the enemy. Let me show you just a few things. Romans 10.1 tells us that we can pray for others' salvation. We can pray for the salvation of others, according to Romans 10.1. We can pray for the safety of others, according to 2 Corinthians 1.11. We can pray for cities, Jeremiah 29.7. We can pray for the strengthening of the faith of others, Luke 22.32. We can pray for authority figures, 1 Timothy 2.2-3. 2, 2 we can pray for the blessing of a nation, 2 Chronicles 7.14. We can pray for miracles, Acts chapter 19, verse 11 through 12. We can pray for these things because we have the power of prayer. We resist the enemy. When you pray for a loved one, don't stop praying for your loved ones. Don't stop praying for your family. You may not see it now. You may not think your prayer is working, but it is. When you pray for your loved ones, I feel like this is for someone watching. When you pray for your loved ones, the enemy tries to tell you that your prayer isn't working. But see... The only real weapon that the enemy has is the weapon or the lie that keeps you from using yours. The only weapon that the enemy has is the weapon that keeps you from using yours. I'll put it this way. It's like you have a military tank and the enemy has a pistol. And the only way he's going to win that war is if he convinces you that your tank will not work, that your tank is powerless, that your tank isn't going to do anything. And so he just needs to get inside your head. And once you're convinced that the tank doesn't work, he can take you out with the pistol. That's what it's like with prayer. And his lie is telling you your prayer's not working, your prayer's not working, only because he knows if he can get you to stop praying, that's the only way he can defeat you. That's why he works so hard at convincing you that your prayer isn't working. But whether you see it or not, know this, it is impossible to accomplish nothing in prayer. If you are praying, you are growing. If you are praying, you are changing. If you are praying, you are transforming. If you are praying, you are resisting the enemy. If you are praying, you are defeating darkness. For every moment you are praying, you are accomplishing spiritually. Every moment in prayer, something is happening. Every moment you spend in the presence of God, you're becoming more like Christ. Whether you see it manifest immediately or not, every moment you are praying, you are destroying the kingdom of hell and you need to be convinced of that and stop letting the enemy lie to you and stop. he's trying to get you out of your tank. Stay in your tank. That's number three, resisting. Number four, the fourth realm of prayer is reading. And by the way, I have some teachings coming up on spiritual warfare. I know I've been promising them, but uh, I've been working really hard on these teachings on spiritual warfare and I believe they're going to set people free. Uh, Steve, we went out to dinner the other day. I gave you a little sample. What did you think of the, the spiritual warfare stuff? Oh, man, it, it's, it's so deep, more than, more than what people realize, and, and how deep you go into it, it's great. And I, I'm really excited. I'm, 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 I, I, yeah, I, know. I, I shared that with you at dinner a, a 
several, about two months ago, and I, I'm going to share it with you soon, but I've been very prayerfully approaching it. I'm talking hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of studying these topics. And so I'm going to bring you a brand new teaching on, uh, I don't even know what we're going to call it yet, but I got a lot of information. We're still trying to structure it into a teaching, but keep watching Spirit Church. We're going to get to that in the coming months. But so, so again, if you feel kind of cheated on the, on the resistance here, on the spiritual warfare, just know that I'm working on more. Okay, number four, the fourth realm of prayer is reading. Reading the Bible. Now, I'm going to share something with you that I get really excited about every time I teach it. And it's found in John chapter 6. And this will be the last um, real uh, point I'm going to make. And then after, uh, this will probably take me about another 10, 15 minutes. And then we're going to close this up. So again, there's silence and stillness is the way you enter. And that's only by the Holy Spirit. And you can find silence and stillness through prayer request or requesting and reverencing or worshiping. Those first two realms of prayer really help us get through to silence and stillness. So John chapter 6, um, let's go begin at verse 33. John chapter 6, verse 33. Now Jesus is teaching a crowd of people. And you have to imagine at this point, people are starting to follow the teachings of Christ. Well, I shouldn't say teach. They're starting to follow him. Most people that crowded around him were there for the miracles or for the food. They didn't really want any transformation. In fact, when he would turn to them and say, you know, sell this or give up that or deny yourself, people would start to flee. So this is one example. The movement is starting to gain momentum. People are starting to follow Christ. John chapter 6, verse 33 says this. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So this statement is coming after he correlates this with the manna from heaven that came in from Moses. That itself is an entire lesson we'll get in another time. But again, verse 33, listen very carefully to how he says. I'm going to read it again. He says, The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And the people responded, Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. And Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And it's a powerful verse. Actually, I want to read the next two verses. He says, but you haven't believed in me, even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never, never reject them. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me not to do my own will. Remember John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1, verse 14. And then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh. In fact, the, the word incarnation is what I want to bring to you. So number one, we see here Jesus talking about His incarnation. The Word becoming flesh. Incarnation. Think of carnivore. Um, you know, carniceria, as some of us Hispanics would know, or carne asada. So it's meat, it's flesh. So the incarnation is the incarnation. It's the coming into the flesh of Christ. It's the process by which Christ, the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Son of God, the Word of God, became flesh. So he says, I'm the bread. Now this is powerful because he starts off talking about his incarnation. Now, for the sake of time, we have to skip down several verses. Go to verse 53. Um, Jesus starts to uh, elaborate on this. And the scripture says this in verse 53. So Jesus said again, now he's trying to reiterate to these people because they're just not getting what he's saying. He says, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. Okay. That's not something I would say if my movement was beginning to grow and people started crowding. You know, nowadays, in many churches, they'd be like, Jesus, don't say that. You're going to lose the people. You're going to weird them out. You can't be too spiritual. Jesus just wants to preach the truth. And so he tells them again, read in verse 54 now. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. That's very key the way he words it. He says, at the last day. Now, this is interesting here because... A lot of people think that when he's talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, that he's talking about transubstantiation. That's a fancy word for 
the communion that we take, that when we actually take it or drink it, that that actually becomes his flesh or actually becomes his blood. That's not what he's saying. And I'm going to show that to you in a scripture that actually says that the flesh accomplishes nothing. In other words, nothing in this physical world can bring salvation. And that's what Jesus' overall message is here about the bread of life. But he talks about the flesh and the blood because he's making reference to his crucifixion, to take part in his crucifixion, take part in his death. So number one, his incarnation. Number two, his crucifixion. It gets, it gets even deeper here. And you got to realize, he hadn't died, resurrected, ascended, none of that. He hadn't done any of that yet. So everybody listening is getting really confused. Then verse 54, again, I'll read it. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. Keep that word in mind. Keep that phrasing in mind. At the last day. This is, I'm telling you, this is going to bless you. This is going somewhere. At the last day. Keep that word in mind. Now, that he's talking about is resurrection. Now, what day is he talking about? John 14, 20. This is what the scripture says in John chapter 14, verse 20. And Jesus, using the same terminology here, says, When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. When will he be raised to life? He'll be raised to life, after the, obviously, after the crucifixion. But when he is raised to life, then you'll know that you're in the Father and in me, and that there's that oneness that takes place. So you will know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. There's that intertangling, that oneness that is taking place. Now, I want to be very careful about the way I read that because he phrases it a certain way just, just so. So, Jesus is saying that at some point, there's going to be this oneness. That point is after he's raised to life again. Now, read again verse 54. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. Verse 55 says, For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. There's that oneness again that he's talking about. So John chapter 14 and John chapter 6, he's talking about the same oneness. So when does all this take place? Well, he was incarnated, crucified, resurrected, then we become one with him. We participate in his death and we become one with him in the resurrection. That's death unto self, John 3.30. I must decrease, but he must increase. So... Jesus is talking about the incarnation, the crucifixion, and now the resurrection. When I am raised to life again. Now this is powerful. Now skip down to verse 60. And now, now the disciples say, the scripture says in verse 60, many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? And then I love this. I mean, here they are getting kind of stirred up saying, wait a minute, this is, this is odd. This doesn't make any sense. Jesus, instead of saying, oh, well, let me explain it to you, or oh, well, let me be a little more sensitive. Oh, this is what Jesus says. I love the way he responds. Remember, big crowd there. He turns around and says, Jesus answers, Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. So he said to them, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? So he's saying, oh, you, th oh, that you think that's odd. Well, wait till you hear this. Jesus keeps pushing it further because he doesn't care that he's offending them. He wants to communicate the truth. So he says, what will you think if you see the, the Son of Man ascending to heaven again? There it is, ascension. So here in John chapter 6, already Jesus has talked about his incarnation, his crucifixion, his resurrection, now his ascension. Now I'm going somewhere with this on the reading being the, the, the fourth realm of prayer. This is important. You're going to understand reading the Bible on a whole different level here. So that ascension is the fourth thing he mentions. But then we see in verse 63 a sudden turn. Watch this. Let's read verse 62 again. Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend into heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. The flesh accomplishes nothing. There you see why it wasn't transubstantiation. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe me. This is powerful. Jesus goes from talking about the Holy Spirit, or goes from talking about himself, 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 incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, spirit. He goes from talking about the Son of God to the Spirit of God. Just a sudden turn. What happened there? Well, 
1 Corinthians chapter 15. Man, I love teaching this one. This one is one of my favorite lessons. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, I believe, says this. Yes, verse 45. The scripture says this. The scripture tells us the first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. Incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, translation. This is powerful. John chapter 16, verse 7 says, and this is Jesus talking, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do will go away, then I will send him to you. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit can't come unless I go. And I was thinking about this. I said, Lord, what is, what is all this about? Because this transfiguration takes place after the ascension, after Jesus has gone back. The transfiguration of the Son of God becoming the Spirit of God took place after Jesus ascended. Now, Christ is still in bodily form as we know it, but here's the way I look at it. You see, on my phone, I have pictures of me and my wife on vacations. I have pictures of my nephews laughing, smiling, moments that I'll never get back. I, I take pictures of them. I, I love, there's a missionary I know by the name of Billy Hall who says that pictures are great because it's, it's almost as if you can freeze time with them. And I've always thought that was an interesting thought. But if I should lose my phone or it should shatter or break, then the information that's on this phone the pictures is gone forever. However, there's a software on my phone. It's called the cloud. And it stores my pictures, not just on the phone, but on an internet server, so that if my phone should become broken, that the pictures are still on the cloud. You see, when Jesus walked here on earth, people pulled him this way or that way. The woman with the issue of blood came in and touched the hem of his garment. At the same time, it was only moments earlier that Jairus had gone and said, Jesus, my daughter is dying. Please help her. And then the moment he turned to help the woman with the issue of blood, Jairus' daughter died. And he had to go and visit the dead girl. And he had to kick the mourners out because they were mocking him. And then he had to cross over here and cross over there. And they called to him here. And the centurion uh, servant was sick. And the centurion said, help my servant. And Jesus sent the word. And people were having to touch him and claim that the blind man said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. People had to reach for him, grab for him, and get his attention. But he was only in a bodily form. And he could only do one thing at a time, really. He limited himself. He did it on purpose. Jesus was only able to be accessed from one point at a time. Now, I watched a commercial the other day about um, this new technology that, that I forgot what the company was, and they're calling it the cloud. I, I can't say it's too new. But they said, from the cloud, we can send information up and receive information. We can communicate to one another. We can store information. And, and they started listing all of these benefits of the cloud. You know, Jesus ascended on a cloud, and I think, though that's not... I wouldn't say theologically that that's exactly what the scripture meant by it. I can say that it represents a great analogy. That Jesus ascending on the cloud was just as important as us storing our information on the cloud. Jesus said, I have to go so the Holy Spirit can come. It was as if, again, this is just an analogy. It was, just, it was as if Jesus, the information, was uploaded onto the servers of heaven and came back in downloadable information by the Holy Spirit. And now Jesus can be accessed anywhere, at any time, by anyone. The Holy Spirit is Jesus on the cloud. And he says this in the same verse, verse 63, And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. When you read the Bible, you're not just reading a historical account, or poetry, or a narrative, or an epistle. You are reading, and you are receiving the information of the Son of God, and you're downloading Christ in you. So, in essence, we as believers do believe in reincarnation. For Christ was become incarnate, and He becomes reincarnate in you. 
and the process starts up again. Just as the Holy Spirit caused the Word to become flesh, so the Holy Spirit causes this Word to become flesh in you. The Holy Spirit causes this Word to come alive in you. The Holy Spirit causes this Word to become the incarnation of Christ in you. This is prayer. This is fellowship. When you read these words, you're spending time with Jesus and becoming more like Him. So then, prayer is not just an upload, but it's a download. And the issue is not just my hardware, it's my software. That when I connect with God, my software is being upgraded because I'm downloading the Christ into me. The Word is becoming flesh in me. The process begins again. Incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, translation. I mean, that's us. That's salvation was our incarnation. Death to self is our crucifixion. The ascension is the times of worship and prayer. The, the translation is our glorification. When we spend time in the Word, we're actually fellowshipping with Jesus Himself. And the Holy Spirit is taking this Word. He's the Spirit. This is the life. And it's causing that life to come alive in you. Well, that is the four realms of prayer. I pray that that has been a blessing to you. I, I know I get stirred every time I, I see it in Scripture. I just Each one of those points could be a, a full three-hour teaching in and of itself. I know this Spirit Church has gone a little long, but... I wanted to get all four, originally this was going to be a two-part in the two different, but I wanted to get all four realms to you uh, right away and, and just bless you with that. And I, I pray that you were blessed with that. But now let's pray. I, I want to pray for one thing. And I want to pray that the Holy Spirit would begin to touch your heart. And whether you're someone who's praying and you're, you're pursuing the depths of prayer and you want to go deeper, or you're someone who you say, I need to reclaim that prayer life. I want to believe God that there's going to be a stirring on your heart. Let's pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name. Let the fire so stir them today that the Holy Spirit would begin to do work in their hearts. Lord, I pray for that one watching who is asking for a move of your spirit, who is asking for a fresh stirring, who is asking for their heart to be set ablaze for Jesus. Lord, set their hearts ablaze with a passionate, fiery love for Jesus, a commitment to his person. Let them hunger for the word. Let them hunger for worship. Let them hunger for the deeper places of prayer. Let them desire to fellowship with you, Lord. And I pray today that desire would be kindled right now. We reclaim our prayer lives in Jesus' name. Now there's a woman watching who you're, you're deaf in your left ear. You're deaf in your left ear. And I want to pray for you right now. And you've had that deafness. It's been an issue that's come about. And you've had that issue for three years now. But I believe that God is setting you free right now in the name of Jesus. I command that ear open in the name of Jesus. We give you the glory, Lord. There's a young man watching me. You're 16 years old. You haven't told anybody about this, but you're suicidal. In fact, you, I originally had saw you writing in a notepad. The Lord corrected me. He said, no, he wrote it in his phone notes. I see like a yellow screen and you're writing words in and you're writing a, a suicide note. You're working on it. God does not want you to commit suicide. God does not want you to give into that spirit. That's a spirit that's come on you. And I command today that you be loosed from that demonic spirit in the name of Jesus. Now, as Stephen continues to pray, I want to talk to you about supporting this ministry. Don't, don't, don't close the tab. Don't close the video. Listen, I, I need you to hear me on this. This ministry has grown over, I mean, I've been in ministry and, and we've been in doing ministry for over 10 years. I mean, there are there are three guys in this room right now, I just realized, who've been with me since, I mean, Anthony Tahaji's been with me since 16, Gabriel since 16, Steve since, I don't know, 9, 10 years old. But I went in the ministry when I was 13. And, you know, it's been over 10 years now that I've been an evangelist preaching the gospel. I've never stopped. It's been constant. And God has just been faithful every step of the way. God's favor has been with us. And that's partly because of you, supporters like you. But now we're entering into a place where the ministry is growing, things are great, but man, it's time to expand. It's time to step out in faith. Now there are people watching me, you can sow a thousand dollars or more. And there are people who you're watching, you, you have it within your hand and you're withholding. I don't know why. Maybe you don't feel connected because it's online. Maybe you feel I'm talking to everyone else because you see several hundred views on this video or however many they may be. But whatever the disconnect may be, let me tell you, you, you hear of these, these ministries that God uses in the nations of the world. 
I believe this because God showed it to me. This ministry is going to become one of the most effective ministries in the entire world, one of the most effective evangelistic ministries in the entire world. I know you can see it because God, God showed it to me. And people on the outside looking in, they, they can see it. We know they can see it. I know you can see it. I want you to be in on the ground level. I want you to be able to say, I was a part of that ministry when they were just doing, lo you know, not local television, but when they were just getting started on television for a couple of years, when they were just doing spiritual, when they were just doing fundraisers. Let me tell you something. You're going to be a part of something that I believe will help bring in a great sweeping in of souls. But I challenge you as a brother in Christ to step out in faith. You say, Lord, I want to sow into that ministry, but this, this, and this has to be in order. No, 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 no. It's not about waiting for the right opportunity. It's about creating the right opportunity through faith. You say, God bless me and I'll give, but God says, you give and I'll bless you. Watch and see if God doesn't pour it out upon you. Now, ultimately, when you give, it's going to the gospel. I preach and I'm going to continue to preach the full, uncompromised, clear and compelling gospel message of Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus will save you from sin and hell if you'll repent of your sins, turn to him and follow him the rest of your life here on earth. That's what I preach, the gospel. I'm not being moved by the modern day grace heresies that are starting to inflict its, its demonic hold on the church, none of that. We are preaching Christ Jesus. Though it might not be politically correct, it's biblically correct, and that's what I'm gonna continue to preach. Now here's where I need you. There are thousands of you that watch. I mean, not every video gets all of you watching, but we get tens of thousands of views every single month, different viewers. Now, I need, I, I need you, Spirit Church members especially. If you're a Spirit Church member, it's time to start sowing again. Some of you, you, you were faithful with your tithes and offerings and you've stopped. Continue to sow. You're a member of this church, you need, to, you need to sow faithfully. If you're someone who just watches and receives, I don't mind that you just watch and receive if you don't count yourself a member. But we also need people to start sowing into this ministry. We are ready to go to the next level. We're ready to start doing more than has ever been done before. We're ready to start doing events. We've done some events on the scale of a few thousand people showing up, but we want to even multiply that. It's time we start reaching for more souls. Look, the world is gathering around its agendas. The world is supporting its political, cultural agendas. We, the church, need to do that because we're the light in the dark place. So I want to challenge you. You're watching, you're wrestling in your heart, whatever. You have $1,000 and you could sow it. Time to sow it. God's speaking to you right now. There are some people, that's you. You Stop fighting it. Look, I used to be intimidated to do this with offering because I thought people might think I'm this or that. You know, I, 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 the Holy Spirit convicted me. He says, enough of that because if you truly believe that people will be blessed when they give, then tell them so. And I'm telling you so. And, and this is not for me. This is for the gospel. This is for the gospel. This is for the ministry. So I'm challenging you today. Step out in faith. Become a monthly supporter. I need at least a thousand new $30 a month partners if we're gonna enter into the next phase of ministry that we have planned. We're talking major, major things that are opening up to us. And I wanna challenge you to come on board with us now and stay faithful in supporting this ministry. So you can go ahead and do that by clicking on the link. Um, on these YouTube videos, there's a link that comes up. There's a little eye in the top right hand corner. You click that, you click on the donate button. It'll take you right to the page where you can do it. Now, if you're watching this, on the, the mobile app, the ministry mobile app, that feature is not available. The app disables that feature for the plug-in purposes, but you can go to our website and do so. So that's my heart. I need, I need your support. I need you. I need you. You see, these things don't just happen. These ministries don't just grow out of nowhere and spring up out of nowhere. It's people like you who say, I'm going to support that ministry because I believe it can make an impact. And you come in and you help make history. Let's do it. Let's touch the world. And I challenge you to do that today. I pray that you're blessed. I pray that you're inspired. I pray that you're stirred. Until next time, remember this. I really do mean it. I know I say it every time we close. It's not just a cliche. Until next time, I want you to remember that nothing is impossible with God.